Hey, how's it going? This video is going to be about how we can use Jacques Pengsepp's affective neuroscience to better understand depression. In order to do that, I want to go into more detail of two of the seven biologically inherited primary affective systems. So this video, I'm going to go into more detail about the grief system and the seeking system and tie them together to formulate depression as an evolutionarily conserved mechanism to terminate separation distress. So let's start with why the grief system evolved and some of its features. To understand Pengsepp's grief system, I think we first have to do an overview of one of his bigger influences, which is John Bowlby and his attachment system. So humans are born physically and psychologically immature. Newborn babies are unable to take care of even the most basic of needs. Babies are completely dependent on their mother slash primary caregiver, which is to say they're not able to survive without their mother taking care of basically all their needs. In comparison, we see that other animals are born more fully developed and are capable of independent survival much quicker than humans. To make up for this, humans have evolved a very complex attachment system. So John Bowlby focused on the importance of the bond between an infant and their primary caregiver. And he noted that we have an attachment system that allows us to get our needs met. So there are four key components to our attachment system. The first is proximity maintenance. So this system is designed for the infant to desire to be near their caregiver, to maintain a close proximity. The second is that the attachment system maintains a safe haven. So it causes the infant to return to the caregiver for comfort and safety when feeling frightened or feeling threatened. The third component is the attachment system maintains a secure base. So infants use their caregiver as a base from which to explore their environment. And the fourth component of the attachment system is separation distress. So infants experience anxiety whenever they're separated from their caregiver. So Pengsepp formulated that this separation distress is mediated by what he called the grief system. So the grief system is activated whenever the infant perceives that he is separated from his primary caregiver and is responsible for the emotional pain and anxiety caused by the separation. So when young animals are separated from their primary caregiver, they emit what are called distress vocalizations. And they do this because when they're left alone, they feel very insecure and they need a way to communicate to their primary caregiver that the caregiver needs to return. So there's a very adaptive value to infants crying and getting upset when their mother leaves. And the adaptive value is the same reason why the cry of a lost child pulls so heavily on our heartstrings. And maybe you've even noticed that you have more of an emotional pull to a child crying because it's lost compared to a child crying for another reason, like it's hungry or it wants a toy. So if these distress calls didn't exist, a mother could permanently separate from their child accidentally. So this helps us to understand that the survival of the infant is linked to the audio vocal distress that allows it to rejoin with its mother. And it's these distress vocalizations that are the cardinal signs of an aroused grief system. So our grief system uses pain pathways as a means of reconnecting a child to its primary caregiver. So this helps us to understand that our grief system has two prominent and opposing facets. The first is that our grief system is activated when we feel abandoned, and the grief system makes us feel bereft and miserable. The second facet is that when the distress is alleviated, we feel emotionally stable in our secure attachments and we feel a deep sense of comfort and security. To repeat that another way, when we feel separated from our primary caregiver, the grief system is activated and we feel pain. When we get reunited with the primary caregiver, we get flooded with feel-good chemicals like opioids and oxytocin, and we feel relief. These aspects of the system allow us to understand that when grief is aroused, animals feel intensely motivated to seek reunion. And that's because grief's an ancient affective system, and it mediates the intense affect that we describe as psychological pain. So the feeling of grief, even though it's very painful, is essential for our survival. So it's this system that mediates the pain and the pleasure of living as a social species. So it's the desire for our close attachment with the mother, which allows for security, and the pain of separation, which acts as a deterrent to separation, which then serves as the emotional blueprint for all of our social connections. Now, before I connect this to depression, let's talk a little bit about another system, which is the seeking system. So Pengsepp's seeking system was traditionally called the brain reward system. When this system is aroused, animals exhibit an intense and enthused curiosity about the world. So this system is primarily associated with the mesolimbic dopamine pathway and it's stimulants that artificially activate this system. So coffee, cocaine, methamphetamines. So it's this system that drives an animal to engage with its environment 
to seek out resources and explore new opportunities. And it's associated with feelings of curiosity, anticipation, and motivation. So it's the seeking system that provides a positive, enthused affect that often counteracts negative feelings in order to get us to engage with the environment. For example, in animals, it's the seeking system that drives behaviors like foraging and hunting. So even though an animal is hungry, it will still feel a compulsion to search for food, explore its environment, and will persist in the behavior until it finds sustenance. When a child seeking system is activated, they'll play and explore their surroundings and leads them to touch, taste, and interact with the objects around them. And it helps them learn about their environment. And in adults, we experience this when we engage in activities like reading or learning a new skill or solving a puzzle. It's the seeking system that fuels us to gain new knowledge or solve a problem and the pleasure derived from that. So we can think of the seeking system as a system that keeps us in a general state of engagement. And it allows us to suppress other negative emotions. For example, the fear system. To put that another way, when the seeking system is activated, it generates positive emotions and a sense of purpose that helps mitigate the negative impact of negative emotions. So I'll provide an example. Imagine there's a person who recently moved to a new city for a job. And being in a new city makes the person feel anxious and fearful about navigating an unfamiliar environment and meeting new people and settling into a new routine. So this anxiety is driven by the fear system, which responds to potential threats and uncertainties. Well, despite that fear, the person is still able to activate the seeking system and activates the desire to discover new places like interesting cafes or cultural landmarks, and they build an excitement and an anticipation. So the positive emotions generated by the seeking system allows them to override these fears and allows them to discover new places and make new friends. And eventually those initial feelings of fear and anxiety start to diminish. So the seeking system becomes a powerful counterbalance to the initial fear and anxiety of moving to a new city. And by engaging in exploratory behaviors and setting goals and learning about the new environment, the person experiences positive emotions and increased confidence and has an adaptive response to a new and potentially stressful situation. So just a small pause in the video. If you enjoyed this content or my other content, definitely head over to psycho.farm and check out the new antidepressant course. So I put together a course with a ton of videos that go over depression, SSRIs, SNRIs, TCAs, MAOIs, and the atypicals. I made it with the intent to be accessible and practical. I think it's worthwhile if you're a student or a practicing psychiatrist, you'll still get something out of it. But let's get back to the video. So now that we have a better idea of what the grief system does and what the seeking system does, I think we can move to understanding depression a little bit better. Depression is considered to be a syndrome, and that means that it's a collection of symptoms and signs that occur together and characterize a particular condition. So rather than being defined by a single symptom, depression encompasses a range of emotional, cognitive, physical, and behavioral symptoms that collectively indicate a depressive disorder. So the DSM-5 lists nine of the symptoms, which are considered the Siggy cap symptoms. But it notes that at least one of the symptoms is either one, a depressed mood, or two, a loss of interest or pleasure. And this second aspect, the loss of interest or pleasure, which can also be considered anhedonia, I think of as really the core aspect of depression. And I think this because there are a lot of reasons to experience a depressed mood. Sadness is really a normal component of being a human being. Whereas a loss of interest or pleasure in activities that normally bring you pleasure, I consider to be more pathological. And when people experience a real depression, you really see a loss of capacity to experience pleasure in relation to virtually every type of reward. Now, the DSM-4 noted that the symptoms of depression are not better accounted for by bereavement. And I think it's unfortunate that the DSM-5 removed this exclusion. But the bereavement exclusion existed out of a recognition of a deep continuity between the symptoms of grief and bereavement and that of depression. So Freud was one of the first people to point out this connection between depression and bereavement by considering melancholia as a pathological descendant of mourning. So in his paper, Mourning and Melancholia, he drew the connection by considering melancholia, which is depression, as a pathological descendant of mourning. He noted that in mourning, the external world is impoverished, while in depression, the ego is impoverished. So he observed that there's a deep relationship between depression and the brain mechanisms that encode social loss. And even today, we see that early separation experiences, like the death of a parent at a young age, is a major risk factor for the predisposition to depression. So Pankstep found a parallel between the experience of separation distress and depression. 
So let's walk through the two major steps that occur during a separation of an infant from its primary caregiver. So the first step that occurs when a child separated from their primary caregiver is the protest phase. This leads to activation of the grief system and triggers vocalization and separation calls. The child experiences high level of anxiety, distress, and anger. And the protest phase reflects the child's strong attachment and the urgent need to reunite with the caregiver. The purpose of this behavior is to draw the caregiver's attention and prompt their return. So it involves vigorous efforts to regain contact with the attachment figure. And it's accompanied by high arousal and intense emotional distress. So here the grief system is highly activated, leading to significant stress and psychological pain. But here the seeking system is still activated. So during the period of active protest, all behavioral indicators, like the hyperactive agitation, means that the grief system has aroused the dopamine-mediated seeking urges in an attempt to reunite with the caregiver. Now, if the grief system is continuously activated without resolution, meaning that there's not a reunion with the caregiver, this leads to the second phase, which is the despair phase. So the child's initial protest behaviors subside, and they're replaced by quieter, more withdrawn behaviors, where the child becomes passive and apathetic. In a sense, the child has given up on a reunion with the primary caregiver, and now feels a profound sense of hopelessness and sadness. And the energy previously directed towards active protest is now diminished, reflecting a shift to resignation and despair. So the child exhibits behaviors indicating withdrawal, reduced social interaction, and a dampening of emotional responses. Let me recap that by considering a young child at daycare who's separated from their parent. At first, they'll undergo a protest phase, where the child cries loudly, clings to the parent, and may try to run after them after they leave. This behavior is a clear attempt to prevent the separation and elicit a return. The child feels acute anxiety and distress and shows visible signs of panic and agitation. This leads to the despair phase. So if the parent doesn't return soon, the child's crying diminishes and they may sit quietly, appearing sad and withdrawn. And the child may refuse to engage in activities or interact with others. So the initial intense distress gives ways to feelings of hopelessness and sadness, reflecting a deep sense of loss and resignation. So why does the child undergo this despair phase? So the shift from protest to despair following social losses suggests a conserved psychobehavioral shutdown mechanism that initiates and promotes depression. So the purpose of the despair phase may have been the benefits of terminating protracted separation distress. So if the infant sustained separation distress, basically if they kept crying and making a big fuss, it could prove fatal for the infant because it could alert predators to prey or it could exhaust the infant if they remained in the protracted panic phase. So Panksepp believed that this process taking place could serve as a model of depression. So he hypothesized that the core aspect of depression revolved around the process by which separation distress is normally shut down. So when a human adult has a prolonged activation of their grief system, they shut down their seeking system, which then shut down all the other affective systems as a way to fundamentally give up in relationship to all potential biological goals. In a sense, the person's in a quasi-analgesic state, a form of numbness. By decreasing the energy in the seeking system, they impair their hedonic tone, so they decrease their ability to gain pleasure from activities that normally give biological rewards. So I hope now you can see how this sequence takes place during bereavement. So when a person experiences the death of a loved one, the emotional and behavioral responses closely mirror the separation processes that occur in infants. So initially, in the protest phase, the bereaved individual might display intense emotional reactions like crying, shouting, and an overwhelming sense of disbelief and yearning for the deceased. This phase is driven by the same neurobiological mechanisms of the grief system, where the brain's separation distress circuits become highly active, leading to acute feelings of panic and despair. These reactions are the mind's way of trying to reestablish the lost connection reflecting the deep attachment bond that has been severed. As time progresses and the reality of the loss sets in, the individual may enter the despair phase. Here, the outward protest subsides and is replaced by profound sadness, withdrawal, and a pervasive sense of hopelessness. The bereaved individual might exhibit behaviors like isolation, diminished interest in daily activities, and a general dampening of emotional expression. This shift occurs as the brain rewards pathway which once lit up with thoughts and interactions with the loved one becomes less active. And this phase aligns really well with the acute distress seen in major depressive episodes, where feelings of sadness, anxiety, and agitation dominate. So both conditions involve a heightened activity of the grief system with elevated levels of stress hormones and pronounced emotional pain and distress. 
Now, we know that depressive episodes aren't always triggered by the loss of a loved one, but it's important here to recognize the human capacity for symbolic losses and symbolic separations. Things like the loss of a job, moving to a new place, existing in a social environment that doesn't match your values, these are all things that are psychologically symbolic losses and symbolic separations. So to summarize, sustained activation of the grief system can lead to a shutdown and downregulation of the seeking system. And in this model, we can understand depression to be downregulation of mesolimbic and mesocortical dopamine systems. We know that the grief circuitry evolved from general pain mechanisms, and that it's this emotional system that forges social bonds and dependencies between infants and caregivers, and is used as the foundation to regulate adult social relationships and solidarity. The affective consequences of a severed attachment bond leads to adults suffering in a distinct way that we call grief. And when this suffering is prolonged, it could be the precipitant of psychosocial pain that is the entry point for a depressive episode. Stronger more than ever. Hour after hour, work is never over.